wrestling there is a lot of it to talk about and who better to hear it from than waiting and to a lesser extent john pollock this is rewinded dynamite hello way hey john how are you doing uh i'm doing good i feel my brain is almost at that stage where it's just starting to melt Mm, starting to melt okay um which is never good um hmm. but there's a lot of stuff that's uh going on so anyway I'm looking forward to chatting about all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, as always. I mean, um, th- this this year, you know, this is the first time we both have um, AEW, NXT, and a G1 on the same day. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, I can see it being a little overwhelming at the same time. I mean, it's a lot of great wrestling, like all in the same night. So we'll try to navigate as much as we can. Yes. Uh we have not seen NXT, but uh, according to Braden, it sounds like Shawn Michaels was okay, everybody. He was on NXT tonight, and it seemed like he was just fine. So fine that I don't think they even brought it up. Mm. It's a tough one. Like, it's one of those things that really makes you wonder how much communication one one side has with the other. Um, I, oh, did you see? Did the, you hear Hunter today? I well, did, yeah. He doesn't even know. Uh, are you guys part of the draft? I don't know. I'm just going to check it out. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Kyle O'Reilly is going to be drafted to SmackDown and Finn Balor will be on Raw and maybe uh, – I don't know. It's. I, I think Survivor listen, Series – Listen, it's the one thing. It's like – it's. I, I'm not like trying to make it seem that it's like – it's it's an unfortunate situation yet with the Shawn Michaels thing that you had taped this last week and he gets called for this angle. I don't think there was much uh, concern about this looking silly, but – it got it, you have to get pointed out for it because it's it's ridiculous. It makes the company kind of look bad, and you know at the same time I feel for NXT because it's like, is it up to them now to have to shoot an angle to explain it? Like if if they were the ones who initially you know you Sean in this thing, I don't I don't know how it all works, but I think Survivor Series. Will be I, I think it's very clear that especially over the last number of months, I think it's a situation that, and it's realistically, it's always been this way that. Mm-hmm. The main roster will always take precedence, and they are not going to bend over backwards, even for a situation like this, that you could have done Monday's angle without Sean. Sean was not – granted, he was uh, probably – I think he was pretty the, integral, honestly. For the, for you the don't think that, that – uh, I, I Just because he was he, a part of the whole thing, right? And yeah, like Edge was a part of it too, but I think Edge you can kind of excuse because he's an active performer. But if you're going to like have all the legends get their revenge on Sean – on Sunday, I mean, realistically, they would all have to come back on the next day, wouldn't they? Yeah, I'm just saying that, like, if if they viewed that, okay, this is uh, NXT shot this angle, they are, we're not going to make this look ridiculous. You could have worked your way around it. Well, it tells me that, like, you know, whoever is in charge is in charge of like the Monday stuff doesn't necessarily see NXT as that big of a, I don't know, hindrance. Like the the need to make sure an NXT angle um, feels realistic isn't enough for them to want to stop a raw angle. Um, but you know, like I was gonna say, like I think Survivor Series will be really interesting this year, just to see. You know, last year we had a big push for trying to like push NXT as a legitimate third brand. You know, making them very competitive um, leading up to Survivor Series and at Survivor Series itself. Will that change this year? You know, will 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 we even get a three brand? type of thing yeah i think you almost have to do it after last year but it will be um yeah i i I think i think you have to but i mean last year it was nxt that was standing tall and i mean who's to say i Mm -hmm. mean i i think that if if for no other reason you have a month of being able to throw nxt people onto your shows and uh, come november they're going to want a hot shot stuff like that. So I think it's to their advantage to uh, incorporate NXT like they did last year. And, and I mean, last year that was probably the best episode of SmackDown we had all year was that impromptu show built around NXT. Mm-hmm. 
Well, we are going to get to the news, but off the top, uh, it is the end of September. So we quickly wanted to just, uh, first of all, thank all the new patrons uh, that joined the Post Wrestling Post Wrestling Cafe over the past month. Uh, and coming up in October, our G1 coverage is going to be continuing. So if you are on the fence and thinking about jumping in, well, way we've got 12 more G1 shows beginning with Thursday's show at Core Q and Hall. So you sign up, you can dive in and get not just all the G1 shows we've done up until this point, but 12 more to come. Yeah, um, we're going through some very long stretches, I would say, of uh, continuous G1 programming. So every day, John and I, if not it's if not together, then perhaps with some of our other friends, we will get together to review every single G1 Climax show. It's uh, been, you know, a great exercise for us just to see how long we can keep up with them. Um, uh, you know, these sometimes two shows a day. But I think, you know, from what I hear, it's a great way for people to stay engaged with the entire tournament. We try to talk about as many of the nuances of, of the matches, points, standings, you know, s- strategies when it comes to predicting, because I'm so good at predicting these G1s. Um, uh, and, and from what I hear, it's it's a really good form of a guide to navigate people through these tournaments. So uh, if you enjoy that, sign on, stay on to the Post Wrestling Cafe and you get one of those pretty much every single day. Uh, along with that, of course, every Friday, rewind a SmackDown. You either get it live if you want. You can listen to it. Uh, you get a Zoom link every single week. Or you can listen to it after the fact. And this month, of course, not doesn't just cover your typical SmackDowns, but the draft episode that's coming up on October the 9th. So those of you who stay on to the uh, Post Wrestling Cafe will have access to every single one of those. In addition to that, we have our usual Tuesday bonus podcast and starting next week. Well, first of all, let's give a big shout out, okay, um, to Chris from L.A. and Nate Milton for joining me on our WCW Slam Jam Volume 1 review. And thank you to everybody who's listened to it. It was one of the most fun podcasts that I've had the pleasure of hosting. It was basically us listening to and commenting on and reviewing 90s WCW themes that both Nate and Chris hold hold dear uh, very much in their wrestling fandom and um i i just had except time. for mr bang bang they they weren't as much of a fan of that but you know dan Lavransky, dan Lavransky did tell me that this album happens to be one of his favorites and that song in particular happens to be one of his favorites so um at least you know several fans there anyway if you sign on tomorrow if you're a brand new uh, uh member of the cafe you have access to that if you're already a member of the cafe you can find it in your your feed right now uh so we have that already out but then the rest of this month for Rewind Away, we've got a review of WWE Survivor Series 2002 coming out in two weeks. Two weeks after that, WWF's King of the Ring 1995. How much does that podcast weigh? <laughs> oh my god, I didn't even realize. Oh no. Oh no, it's not. Did you say 95? I said 95. Oh, I'm off by a year. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> 95 is a, well, it's a, it's a, it's a crappier show than well, 94. We can change it possibly wow. but i'm sure 95 will be just as fun yes um and then beyond that of course we have the return of our rocky series review and next week rocky three featuring thunderlips featuring thunderlips featuring mr t uh and featuring you know maybe john and i will even don on our uh short shorts and uh tank tops as we uh frolic to the beach before yeah. recording this one Maybe, maybe we will, <laughs> maybe we will, maybe we won't. Uh, but that is coming up next week. Uh, plus, the uh, King of the Ring '95, by the way, is the Mabel King of the Ring. So the, the Mabel year. Yes, I'm sure. There's plenty to discuss. 1995 WWF. You can't go wrong there. So um, all of that, uh, six dollars US gets you in the door for all those bonus shows plus the archive. If you want to go double double, that also gets you uh, live access for our post show that will be following Hell in a Cell which is coming up at the end of the month as well. Uh, so lots of great stuff coming up, uh, primarily led by all the G1 coverage, including three straight shows uh, during that final weekend uh, where they're at Sumo Hall. So it's also your great ch- value. It's also your chance to support everything that you listen to right now. All of these shows that you listen to for free on our free feed, all the writing on the website, it's all supported by... Uh, our patrons at the Post Wrestling Cafe. So we give most of our content out for free just because that's how we've always done it. That's how we want to do it. Uh, But those of you who like us enough to want to 
financially support us. We give you as many bonuses as we as we can. So uh, thank you all for for being patrons. Now I know what people are thinking. Throw in a t-shirt and I'm all in. Almost forgot. Yes, weekly draw for the t-shirt. Um, and if you give me a second to pull up the list. <laughs> this is live, pal. Uh, every single Wednesday on Rewinded Dynamite, if you're a member of the Post Wrestling Cafe, you are automatically entered into a draw to win an item from store.postwrestling.com. It is such it is such a deep list that it takes away minutes to pull up this lengthy list. So if you're a winner, you are really a, a, a rare, rare human being out there to have your name called. It is, it is an illustrious honor, but Way is going to do such by picking a name. And Way, that winner is... Congratulations to Curtis Hames. Curtis Hames from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. T-shirts going out to you. So I'll be sending you a message. And uh, congratulations. All right. Uh, all of the rest of the shows coming up, I highly recommend the Rewind Away episode with Nate and Chris and Way. Uh, as well, I did a G1 show with Benno on Tuesday, going through the B Block show. And Way and I have already done a show on Wednesday, going through the A Block show. And we're back Thursday. So uh, lots of great stuff, including uh, coming up this weekend, the long and winding Royal Road with WH Park and Hisame chatting about Mitsuharu Masawa. It's a whole episode dedicated to his life and career uh, that you'll want to uh, keep your e- your ears open for on Sunday, uh, as they say. Let's move on to some news items, Way The raw number, uh, you know, we were looking at this and thinking, like, wh- how big an, of an effect is the NFL going to – is the NFL game going to have? And it turned out Raw did a very strong number. They did 1 million – 822,000 viewers up 9% this week. Their demo was up 10% doing a 0.55. This was their best number since August 31st uh, over the past month. And this was going against the Ravens Chiefs game that did over 14 million viewers on ESPN. As well, they had the Stanley Cup final game between Dallas and Tampa Bay uh, doing uh, 2,877,000 viewers. So, um, you know, j- just on the core, just looking at the viewership and demo number, um, this was a win for Raw, d- doing as well as they did. Uh, do you attribute it to a- a- any specific factors on Monday? I think you have to look at, you know, d- despite perhaps like evidence the contrary prior in the year. I mean, I, the only thing I can honestly think of is um, the pay-per-view bump, because this was a show that wasn't necessarily promoting like what was what was being promoted here prior well i mean show? they they got the 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 ad out but this was so late in the day that you were gonna have the legends on the show which if that had been out earlier i would put a lot more weight onto it um but man it was like an hour before the show that got out but i i imagine that played a bit of a factor because we have seen earlier this year when they put christian on when they put big show on like there is a little bit of a bump that you get there um and maybe, maybe to a degree, uh, I mean, the third hour did, you know, the, the lowest of the three. But nonetheless, you did have a mystery throughout the show of who was showing up to take on Drew McIntyre. So I don't know if you uh, throw any credit that way either. Yeah, I mean, I really, you know, the only thing I, I, I would really propose is, is perhaps um, maybe some interest coming off of um, the pay-per-view leading to this one. Uh, other than that, you know... Um, Night vision goggles, maybe. Um, but unlike night vision goggles, we <laughs> didn't see that one coming. So um, right. that that would be reflected next Monday. Maybe we're getting I think a monster the interest number. in knowing in knowing whether or not uh, Akira Tozawa was alive after being eaten by a shark. That's uh, true. That might have something yeah. to do with it. I, I really um, don't know. I mean, could do you think that it could be possibly have anything to do with maybe some of the, um, you know, news out there of like certain members not being a part of the show, like. You know, I, we did mention, like, for instance, the NXT show, uh, the NXT invasion of SmackDown. I mean, that stemmed from, of course, all that Saudi Arabia plane ride stuff mm-hmm. that, um, at least for me, like, I was really curious to see how they would put SmackDown together that day. And, um, like, what the news did break that, you know, Retribution was weren't going to be on the show. Um, would That's that have true. had anything to do with it to you? Yeah, uh, like... I didn't see any like non wrestling outlets really covering that story, but it's I I also think like a separate theory that I'd have to like dig in and look at some of the past numbers, but 
I th- I thought about this after payback was that a pay per view that had really little interest. Mm-hmm. We saw the next night, and is that a case of a lot of people that might have skipped the pay per view but still had curiosity to see the follow up to the pay per view? Um, because we saw that with payback, and this was certainly a pay per view that had to me minimal if not negative interest going in agreed like just even in our in our feedback thread for the pay-per-view i think we had like what maybe like two responses Mm -hmm. which is definitely low uh for a wwe show so that's an interesting theory uh all the all their key demos were up this week led by uh young women up 19 percent uh women 18 to 49 were up 13 uh 18 to 34s were up 17 percent um they did still have the third hour drop. There were uh, adults over 50 and women 18 to 49 fell 15% in hour three, as did women 12 to 34. So it's not like the third hour and the uh, the tease of the mystery offset uh, a drop. Now, in Canada, it was a bit of a different story. They did 195,900 viewers. Um, they were the number four most watched sports program in Canada, but uh, the big thing on in Canada on Monday night was not the NFL. That was number three. Number one by a wide margin was the NHL game that did over 1.3 million viewers, which is massive in Canada. So I think Raw got hit big with the NHL game on Monday, especially given it was the um, uh, that you had Dallas facing elimination and ultimately losing. They won't have that problem next week. No, that will not be a problem. Are the, the Jays are out. Is that correct? Are they? I don't even know. Are they already out? Oh, I Jeez. thought that uh, I re- I was not following along. Oh like my god, they lost. They lost two to eight today in a best of three. So yeah, Tampa Bay already knocked them out. So so much for that playoff run. Well, Jeez. there you go. That's uh, what a season. Did you watch it? Oh my my correction. The the raw number in Canada was one hundred eighty five thousand nine hundred. I uh I misspoke earlier. So it was actually lower than the number I first gave there. Um, and while I'm on corrections regarding Canadians. Wait, were you aware that Bobby Roode was traded to Raw earlier this year? I had, I remembered it when someone pointed it out, but I had dude, to, no, dude, I, I completely forgot. No idea whatsoever. Um, I guess he was mentioned as part of the trade, but then never really. He was definitely up. mentioned. Yeah, he's never he hasn't appeared this whole time. Okay, well, but he was he was a Raw member, so there you go. Brand got it. brand loyalty on uh on Monday night. All right, let's uh, continue on here. There was an NXT media call on Wednesday to promote uh, this coming Sunday's uh, NXT TakeOver card. And a couple of the notes to look at um, that Andrew Thompson has here on the website. Uh, Paul Levesque stated that TakeOver is going to have a unique feel and look for an NXT show uh, that fans will see on Sunday. So I don't know what that's alluding to, but... um, Hmm. We will see a different look and feel. I mean, the natural would be, okay, they're, maybe they'll be in the Thunderdome, but if they're going to be in the Thunderdome, you're going to have to do that big public call out for members to be on the screens and stuff. So that would not be a surprise tuning in on Sunday. So yeah. um, if that was the case, you'd know it ahead of time. Well, you know, when he says unique look and feel, I'm assuming they're working on something to, I think, make up for, you know, probably a lack of extras and extras that are going to be in the crowd. Um, maybe they put their own screens in there if they can fit them. Maybe cardboard cutouts. You know. Oh, who knows? Michael Cole would not be happy with that. Oh, that's right. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I was not on this call, so I, I've not heard the call, but it did seem like throughout this, this was not a case of Hunter trying to evade the fact that you know there has been this outbreak. I mean, it was alluded to multiple times. He said that the takeover card, he expects it to stay intact, but did note that anything could happen in these coming days. So I guess it's just fingers crossed that everyone who's booked for Sunday will be fine. Um, Despite all this, the performance center, he said is uh, available for use again after the outbreak, which I I don't know if that's the wisest decision right now. He notes that they are, uh, they are doing their contact contact tracing um, and trying to keep their whole staff safe. He was asked about the rumored uh, NXT party and said that there are punishments for ignoring COVID, COVID protocols uh, and said they are urging talent to take precautions. Put over Kyle O'Reilly, stating that these circumstances likely sped up the process of him getting into this main event position. And then was asked about the draft and Levesque says he does not know how NXT will be incorporated. So I hope someone gives Paul a call in the next week or so and lets him know. 
Yeah, so we got this takeover, and then it's um, the draft basically that Friday. Yep. So if if NXT guys are going to be a part of this, I mean, I'm guessing they're not, because otherwise he would mention, right? I don't think it's a case of NXT being part of the draft, uh, per se, like NXT getting picks. But I do expect, like, at least guys some NXT talent to be drafted away. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yes. Right. Um, so it I'd be, be shocked if we don't. Yeah, that's. That's what I'm expecting. So, yeah, several of these talents that might be on this takeover, I mean, it could be their kind of swan song on NXT, potentially. And the other note he made uh, towards the end of the call was after we saw the angle last week that took Tegan Knox out of the Battle Royal, he did confirm that she has suffered yet another torn ACL and has already had surgery for it. So that makes three torn ACLs for her, which... I remember Chris Sabin having back-to-back torn ACLs, and that was just unbelievable. But for her to have a third one, she's only 25. Um, that That's just, it's heartbreaking that, mm-hmm. man, she has that to face in front of you. It's not just the physical rehabilitation, which is significant in and of itself. But mentally, man, you've got to be a really strong person to be facing your third torn ACL in such a short time. Like this is not spread out over a 15 year career. This is since 2017. Yeah. And you know, you're really, you're talking about time away from the ring. Um, like by the end of this whole ordeal, I mean, we're, we'll probably have looked, looked at like, you know, at least a year, if not more of just inactivity due to rehab. So it's, it's really, of course it's concerning. And I think right now, like, you know, she has talked about like wanting to retire but in the past, like, you know, stemming from these injuries. And I'm sure these thoughts are, are being considered right now. You know, every fan of hers, every viewer of hers, I think is cheering for her to to make another comeback. But man, it's um it's 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 it seems like it's just a, a huge, huge, huge obstacle um that continues to stand in her way. So uh, I wish her the best in recovery. Yes, definitely. Um, this, uh, story was, uh, reported over the last couple of days. And that is that, uh, Joey Ryan, real name, Joseph Meehan, he has filed two lawsuits against, uh, accusers from the speaking out movement. The first lawsuit was filed against three accusers who we are not naming because, uh, some of these accusers did not, uh, identify themselves prior to being named in this suit. Um, that one is being sued, um, in total, he's looking for, I mean, he's looking for significant damages, like in the neighborhood of like $15 million. He is claiming lost revenue of eight to $10,000 per month in bookings, over $1,000 a month in Twitch revenue, $500 in Cameo revenue, $3,000 on Patreon, $1,000 in merchandise, and $3,500 from bar wrestling. This is all on a monthly basis, as well as loss of social media followers. Um, so the first, uh, the the Suits have been filed in the U.S. District and Central Court of California. These were filed last week, but it was just reported this week. The other suit, he is seeking $200,000 from each accuser uh, in – sorry, this is still the first suit. $200,000 from each accuser for economic damages, $5 million in non-economic damages, uh, punitive damages of $10 million, due to malice, hatred, ill will, and despicable and intentional acts, and is seeking retractions for them to delete their past statements. The second suit lists one woman, along with 10 Jane Doe's, um, that he can opt, I guess, to include in this, over six defamatory statements, seeking $25,000 in economic damages, 25 in non-economic damages, and an order retracting and correcting the defamatory statements made he is requesting a jury trial. Um, Ryan had also put out uh, this hour-long video going through a lot of these accusations. He has since made that video private. So, I mean, he has also, um, like, I, I would think that that, that video uh, is going to be looked upon as uh, potentially evidence, uh, even though he has made it private. But um, that is, uh, you know, where he is proceeding here. And, I mean, Joey Ryan was one who, I mean, had uh, volume-wise the most accusations coming against him so i i don't really feel right like uh talking about you know just the uh uh specifics here of like what what happens with with this case but it's obviously this is a you know a very significant story to follow and we will see what 
what happens with uh, these lawsuits uh, moving forward. And, uh, you know, those that are being accused, uh, you know, having having a, uh, a legal defense for all of this. Harold May has left New Japan. Uh, I spoke about this a bit with Benno on Tuesday's show, uh, but this uh, will be effective October 23rd, where he will leave New Japan as president and, and CEO and be replaced by Takami Obari, who is already the uh, current New Japan Pro Wrestling of America CEO. And with Harold May, it was two and a half years that he was with the company and oversaw a pretty a pretty influential time period for New Japan when you look at where that company was in the spring of 2018 and, you know, a lot of ambitious plans that Harold May came into when it came to growing revenue, uh, finding, you know, a big television deal for them, and, you know, being ultimately the guy that oversaw some enormous um, U.S. plans and seeing that key talent leave. So, you know, this is this is a very significant story way, but one that... Um, like we've talked about several powerful figures leaving companies over the past month. It's one that I do think we need the, uh, we need some time to see what the full effects of such a move entail. Yeah. I think there's still a lot that's, you know, unknown about the, why he might've left. Um, certainly I think you can, you know, on the surface, look at several factors and those include, the the position and perhaps the potential and the optimism that this company might have had when he joined versus how he leaves it and some of that has been really out of his control of course you know with the pandemic and everything uh, all the plans that New Japan would have had to you know really embark on a on a real go at you know pr- creating a U.S. based sub subdivision of their company that's of course all you know thrown out, out the window right now so um you know does do do those factors have anything to do with it? Um, I would imagine at least it probably would have something to do with it. Um, but beyond that, you know, um, I'm sure internally, like if you if you ask people maybe more in the know, they might have a lot more to say about how he was as a leader running that particular company uh, versus maybe people who ran beforehand. Um, yeah, yeah. Some of these things I, I don't personally have any indication of. I threw this out to Benno, but I'd be curious about your thought is let's let's fast forward to maybe early 2021 and let, let's hope that things are maybe, you know, slightly better when it comes to the ability to run live events. And you're looking at New Japan and what they've gone through and AEW that despite getting their television money, I mean, they've they've been hit significantly by not being able to run these live events. Do you think that um, with both companies, and this is not even specific to Harold May or not, um, just the companies being in very different situations than they were nine months ago. Is that something that they look like, hey, we we took a hit in 2020 as much as any touring companies will. Uh, do we revisit something that is going to jumpstart our live event business and we sit sit back down and assess if there's reason to have a working agreement or do you think that it's still going to be this kind of uh isolated companies that are not going to have any crossover oh yeah um i think it's definitely a different game now you know you're talking about companies that um like especially in the case of new japan don't have that touring revenue to rely on, on on this side of the world at least so um if i were them and i was looking to continue to maintain a foothold in the u.s i think they're honestly like New Japan is always going to be very much a, a niche product for a lot of people. But if you are looking to grow your company, I, I do wonder how how much room there is for that now. Now that people have sort of AEW as an alternative to the WWE, if, it, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm sure some of this has to be reflected in their own numbers. And if they're seeing a, you know, flatlining or maybe even a decreasing interest from this side of the world, I would absolutely consider a working relationship with all, uh, AEW. Um I think the bigger question is if AEW wants to do it. Yeah. I mean, to me, I just look at it that, you know, nine months ago, it was, there was a lot of logical reasons for the two to work together, but neither was in a position where they had to do it. And I guess they're not in a situation where they need each other either. But when you've had a year where you, you know, you've taken hits, it, to me, it, somewhat changes that perspective that, okay, this is something that can really jumpstart us. And honestly, I think a, a, a kind of meeting, the, the two sides meeting halfway, 
I think would be for this U.S. title and the idea of coming up with a way to do this. Um, I don't think you can do it as long as Moxley is champion, but if we're looking at like a couple months down the road, maybe Moxley's not in that position as champion and we New Japan wants that U.S. title and in order to do so, you offer up Kenta to do Dynamite and that's that's kind of your compromise is that you can have your title, but we get to promote Kenta for a week against John Moxley on our TV. I guess, you know, for me, my question is, what's in it for AEW? I mean, Kenta is, of course, a great hand to have. Anybody on that roster would be a great hand to have. But we see AEW do plenty with guys like Eddie Kingston, who have never had that national TV exposure. Do they need to involve another company? And let's, you know, answer the, the complication of COVID testing. And having people jump across different brands and different companies. Right now, any company has to have an extra careful eye on anybody that they let into their rings. Um, is it worth entering another relationship like that with another company with guys that you don't really have control over? I'm I'm looking more so like next year. But I mean, testing is still going to be a thing next year. Like that's not, I don't think that's disappearing any anytime soon. So you're right. It's it, It's a position where I'm just curious if any of this they revisit that and look at potential because long term i mean i think AEW i think it would serve them great to be able to take a jungle boy and send over to new japan for 6 months and send a private party to do a tag tournament that i think they'd get a tremendous uh a tremendous tour under their belts that would greatly assist them um but may- maybe not like maybe AEW's in a position where once we're able to get crowds back we're going to be fine. We why do we need New Japan? Why do we need them to have any added exposure in the US off our TV when we're fine just isolating ourselves? Like there's certainly that argument that they still after all this they they don't need that versus, you know, some special attractions like having an Okada that they could promote on one of their pay-per-views. Mhm. Uh, and the final thing here, uh, just quickly to look at, uh, Paul Daly, uh, he was not, he did not make weight for his uh, Bellator main event. So this is their debut way on CBS Sports Network. It's happening tomorrow on Thursday at four o'clock p.m. Eastern from Italy. So they've lost their main event between Paul Daly and Derek Anderson, and it will now be uh, Kate Jackson against uh, Denise uh, Kielholtz and this four fight main card that is airing on the CBS. He he didn't make weight, but he's not fighting anyway. He didn't make weight and then was taken to the hospital and the commission was not going to allow him to fight. So uh, he was hospitalized and then they, uh, they canceled the fight. So they lost their biggest fight on this card. This is not uh, a, a card with any names on it. So, I know a lot of people, they were very excited at the fact that this move to CBS Sports Network, all the cards were going to be live. So they're doing this one from Italy. So it will be live. You will get this card live at four in the afternoon. But I think when that number comes in the next day, it will be uh, quite the eye opener of what it means to be live at four o'clock Eastern for a card that is um, very dim when it comes to star power uh, for Bellator. Very unfortunate. You will not be watching? I don't think I get CBS Sports Network. Uh, we don't, actually. We'd have to watch it on DAZN up here in Canada. Um, oh, and last thing I want to mention is our good friend Esther Lin mm-hmm. is leaving MMA Fighting, uh, the most talented photographer I have ever seen. And to me, uh, someone that, man, I just, uh, I, she she has stated that it looks like she will still do the odd uh, project with MMA Fighting, but uh, yeah, she's uh She's leaving, and I just think uh, – I think the world of her. I think she is just so uh, talented uh, beyond just photography. Like a lot of her original work that she's done on MMA fighting uh, with her uh, different video series that she's done as well, like super talented. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, you know, even John and I, even before you and I were fr- uh, friends of, of her and Casey and, and the entire, entire team at MMA fighting, like I was already a fan, and I think – um you know, she she mentioned uh, in in her uh, goodbye on the A list today that uh, you know much of it has to do with I think the fact that uh, COVID is shutting down uh, a lot of you know outside photographers from coming in to shoot, and without being able to shoot as a photographer, I think Esther was left with doing a lot of sort of the other 
other work at, at MMA fighting that um, probably wasn't necessarily what she wanted to do with her career. So she decided to, I think, take a very respectable step, you know, taking like quitting a job in the midst of a pandemic in order mm-hmm. to pursue something that she thinks will make herself more happy. And that seems to be voiceover work and perhaps freelance, other freelance, uh, either photography or other other types of work. And uh, you, you and I both think the world of, of her and, and Casey as talents and it, it, for me personally, like just somebody who managed to bring a real artistic eye in a sport that honestly, like it's called mixed martial, martial arts, but I think honestly it, it's been covered like sports can have such a dry, straightforward feel. And I think like her and Casey have always managed to bring more of a, I don't know, creative uh, uh, look to it that, that has certainly been ins- ins- inspirational for me. So um, I, I have no doubt she'll find great success in anything she she attempts. Yeah. Um, you know, if you see some of uh, the, the timeline videos that she's done, like just, uh, yeah, her and Casey, uh, they're just fantastic. So all the best to her uh, in the, the, the next chapter uh, after MMA fighting. But we will now move on to AEW Dynamite. This was taped last Friday on September 25th. And we had Jim Ross, Excalibur, and Taz on commentary. At the beginning, it's Ricky Starks against Darby Allen, and we got this video, uh, the Darby Allen artistic presentation in black and white with his pal rapper JPEG Mafia, who proceeded to call Ricky Starks a bitch and then rolled this body bag containing God knows what, I'm afraid to ask, uh, down this hill into a ditch. Yeah, it was quite the video. (laughs) <laughs> it's like Quite who's the in there i hope that's not and i hope it's just rocks but this is darby <laughs> allen so i don't take anything for granted the fact that we never saw like the person come out of the body bag i would i would hope that it, it was merely a dummy in there because if it was an actual live human being um without getting the reveal i think you know i'd be concerned um not that i wasn't already about uh darby allen but jpeg mafia making their appearance are you a fan Huge, huge. I was, um, I was, I have no big... idea who, who this was. I mean, I know oh. the name, but I, I didn't recognize him by face. So to me, it just shows you how current the show is and how much cooler, cooler already it is than I am. When he, cause JPEG Mafia, I mean, he's like a, a decent sized name, but when this guy blows up and he's that much bigger, when he's PNG Mafia, I think that, uh, <laughs> that's, that's when he's going to explode. Uh, that's, that's going to be it. Wait till he learns how to move. Jif Mafia. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. This was, uh, yeah. Um, he's come a long way from Bitmap Mafia. <laughs> okay. This is Enough. the longest we can possibly stretch this one out. But uh, <laughs> I had never heard of JPEG Mafia, I'm going to confess. I, I assume that maybe uh, you did, Way, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to uh, assume anything. I'm so, I'm so out of like the current stuff, but um, I, I think he's probably quite popular. What if this guy did an updated Ron Simmons track? Well, I don't know who can beat that original rapper, you know, like, man, line. That's a, that's a song. It brain with it. That was a banger. It is absolutely a banger. It's a bop, you know? Um, okay. I got some lines here. If you, if you will indulge me, John. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm a big grizzly bear out of the woods that have not ate with a serious grudge and I can't wait to get you in the ring and you wonder what's next and I'm going to catch you off guard with a suplex. Even if you got a lot of weight. See, I worked out back in the, my days at Florida State so I could take you out as a matter of fact. I'm going to tackle you like you're a quarterback. <laughs> I'm going to tackle you like I'm a quarterback. Wait, r- repeat that. I'm going to tackle you like I'm a quarterback. I'm going to tackle you... Like you're a quarterback. I'm going to tackle. Yeah. I'm going to tackle oh. you like a quarterback, basically. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That one makes sense. Well, there you go. Um, I'm looking up Jake, JPEG Mafia here. You could. Uh... Did not anticipate a JPEG Mafia discussion on this podcast. I don't know how many people would have. Well, don't send me links, everybody. I don't give a shit. If I want to look it, look him up, I'll, I'll Spotify him myself. I'm sure he's very talented. Oh, believe me, way. If there's anything people listen to and are they're they're so concerned that we might not know something, they w- they will let you know. 
This match, uh, I thought this was a great opener to the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had Ricky Starks, who I, I thought this was a fantastic uh, performance. I have not seen the Ricky Starks match that he had with uh, Ben Ben Carter a few weeks ago on Dark, but I think this was the best match I've seen Ricky Starks have on AEW. These two just blended so well together. Um, Starks uh, gets to the rope on a Fujiwara armbar attempt and then suplexes Starks onto the edge of the apron uh, Allen falls with a tope suicida, and then Brian Cage comes out, followed by Will Hobbs, and the two big men brawl to the back. Allen then gets yanked by the arm, flips onto the floor from the apron. Allen then escapes the Rochambeau attempt into a code red. Starks kicks out, goes back to the Fujiwara armbar, and locks both arms of Starks, but he still is able to get to the rope. They trade slaps. There's a rotating stunner. And then Allen comes off the middle rope, turns in midair, right into a spear. Great spot. The avalanche Rochambeau is blocked, and then Starks gets knocked to the mat, and Darby proceeds to hit a coffin drop to the previously injured back of Starks, and he wins in 10 minutes. A great opener. Fantastic match. I thought both of these two men, like, together, they did a lot of things really well. It was a technical match. There was some great body part work. Uh, Great, like realistic looking submissions from Darby Allen who applies them in a, just a really kind of snappy aggressive way. I think the, the submission thing is, is a really underrated part seemingly of, of Darby Allen's game. Uh, it was fast. It was kept at a really quick, very intense and exciting pace. It both, uh, you know, I, it feels like they've been feuding for quite a while. So I'm, I was a little surprised that this was even their first singles match together, but is it their first singles match together? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think they've only done, like, they've done the... The tags? Tags. Anyway, it still feels incredibly fresh. They have incredible chemistry. I can definitely see these two as being, like, career rivals down the line. Both are incredibly well-rounded. Um, and I would say, you know, if size isn't going to be an issue for either of them uh, in this company, I would say both of them definitely are future world champion potential. Yeah, the really, really strong opener if you, uh, if you missed this one. Shivani is not... On commentary, because he is trying to land an interview with FTR. More on that to come. Dasha brings out Cody. And Cody is asked how he's recovered from the Brody Lee attack. And he noted that Al Snow once told him that you'll always wrestle hurt, but don't wrestle injured. And he makes fun of the old tradition of shaking hands pre-pandemic and said that it was incorrectly chalked up as a sign of respect. But what it really signified was that each wrestler needs the other one. And he said he was shamed when losing the TNT title in three minutes. He mentions going off to shoot the uh, reality show that he did, the game show. And he's looking at these other stars that he's on the show with. And here's here he is, a guy that lost in three minutes. He can't claim to be the ace. There's only three people that can claim to be the ace in this company. Those are Hikaru Shida, John Moxley, and Brody Lee. What a F you to the FTW title this was. I mean, it's not an officially recognized title. I, I mean, come on, you can't have three people poten- be potentially ace. I love the fact that he included Hikaru Shida's name in here. Uh, of course, absolutely. Like in story, like the women's champion should be considered the best wrestler in the company. Like it should have a, at least be, you know, her, her name be thrown into the hat of this conversation. And of course, mentioning Cody, uh, Brody Lee and the TNT title as the ace belt, um, of course is a big way to promote what, what his matchup is next week. So when he's asked if he's going to accept the dog collar challenge, he says, no mentioning the optics of such a violent match as an EVP. And he goes to leave. The announcers are stunned. He pauses, comes back, and says, no, as in no regrets, no turning back, and it's happening next week. And Brody Lee comes out, storms the ring. They have to be separated. Brandy runs out for this dive off the top onto Dark Order. Anna J gets involved. Nyla J goes after Kylan King. Uh, we also had Stu Grayson out there after we did not see him uh, last week, but he was uh, he was there on being the elite and and here. Um, although no Alex Reynolds, who they have explained is off uh, fencing. Yeah, preparing for a brisk. That's right. Yes. So. Um, 
The announcers um, heavily focused on how violent this match is going to be. I mean, that was the one part they really hit hard. Like, this is going to be as violent a match as they have presented on AEW next week. I think the name Dog Collar, like, to somebody who maybe hasn't seen, like, some of the stuff that, like, they've done in the past where this was recognized as perhaps a more serious, legitimate thing. Like, you mentioned Dog Collar much right now. It almost sounds kind of comedic. But clearly, like what they have in mind, and I think what they're going to try to live up to is uh, a very violent standard that like um, wrestlers of, of the past have set for this type of match. So I'm definitely excited to see their interpretation of it. Um, some ways, maybe even a little concerned because we could see how far like Cody in particular might go in these types of, types of matches where um, he's been kind of billed to like do something crazy um and something potentially very damaging to uh his his face so i hope he doesn't go too far um i really loved his promo i mean despite what the guy says this was certainly an ace level promo i think cody has like if anything i think he's getting better like he's got a level of confidence and control of these segments that very few i think have demonstrated in the cur- the cu- current landscape of professional wrestling um He's definitely still proving to be at the very top level. What do you think about his uh, the dye job of his hair? Honestly, it takes some getting used to because, like, you know, when we first saw the blonde, it was like, eh, I don't know about this. Now the black is almost too black. Like, it's so fake. Like, blacker than maybe what he had before even. But I'm it sure. Kinda it kind of looks it. like a guy that dyed his hair himself for the first time. It just looks, it looks uh, weird. The in the pandemic, job. I wouldn't doubt that. He probably did. He probably did. Um, he are you surprised? I'm surprised this is happening so soon. I thought anniversary show uh, would be the the time to do this, but mm. man, this is next week. A little and they're surprised. Gonna, and they're, they're going to be against uh, the NBA next week, so it's a it's a it's a big. Well, they were against the NBA tonight as well for the for the second hour, but n- nonetheless, it's a uh, it's a really big match for next week. I guess they just wanted to spread out their main events because, uh, what is it, Moxley and uh, Archer Archer will be the, the week after that. So maybe they just want to spread it out. So, yeah, we also got a bit of a build here between uh, for, for uh, Anna J and uh, Brandy uh, with Nyla Rose and, uh, sorry, the other name, what was that? Kylan King. Kylan King, yes. So don't know if that'll be a dynamite feud or a dark feud, but um, we got that as well. Yeah, there was a lot in this uh, segment, but the uh, the primary focus was Cody and Brody Lee. Shivani interviewed FTR and Tully Blanchard. They said the best friends. They weren't ready last week. They're glorified backyarders and pat- participation trophy winners. SCU, they're different. They were the first tag champions, and we have to beat them to cement our legacy. Uh, Harwood is asked about the Young Bucks, and he asks, why do they deserve a tag title shot? I was waiting for... Tony to say, hey, you watch Raw? You see Clash of Champions? <laughs> Anyone can get a tag title shot. He explains the Young Bucks lost a private party in the tag title tournament, the inaugural one. They lost to Omega and Page, and they lost in the gauntlet match involving us. He says, like, their biggest attribute is that Dave Meltzer loves them <laughs> and throws them all the stars. And then... Isn't that Tony- enough? I think that's what should determine who gets title shots. <laughs> that, that That is... Uh, that is it. They have uh, really incorporated a Dave here into their attack on the Young Bucks. They're asked about full gear, and with that, Matt Jackson ends up in the in the shot, super kicking Shivani. They're right actually, after he lost his phone. There were actually two feet there, um, so you could you would assume that it was Nick who was the other person as well, who we never saw. Yeah, um, and as well. On being the elite, I mean, they revealed that Nick was never in the room, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, I don't it, think Nick it wasn't was even present. like they didn't even like fake it that he was not in the room. So it was yeah, just Brandon so, Cutler there. Yeah, so Matt did that skid breaking Tony's phone, and of course Nick was absent. And he but was, he said, but he communicated to Nick during that segment. He said, "Nick, I've got this." So who was he talking to? You're right. Yeah. So maybe Nick, maybe Nick was holding the camera. Because who? Because it wasn't Brandon Cutler. Uh, I guess maybe, so. Maybe he calls everybody Nick. Maybe he was watching Nickelodeon. He's like, hey, <laughs> he likes to talk to his team. Maybe, maybe he was referring to Brandon. And he said, hey, I've got this prick. <laughs> prick so, and Nick sound very similar. Yes. 
Uh, he's asked about full gear. Matt super kicks Tony. FTR said, hey, why don't you come after us? And Jim Ross and Excalibur are livid that their colleague was taken out with a super kick. Yeah, so this time, I mean, you know, the Young Bucks have definitely, I would say, you know, been attacking people. Uh, that, And I think you could still definitely interpret them as, like, baby faces because they're t- attacking, like, you know, people like... Um, uh, what's what's the interviewer's name? Um, Alex Marvez. Like, I'm sure if there were audiences, they would be cheering for that. But now I would say Tony is a sort of a beloved figure. You know, you've attacked Tony. Uh, now you have JR and Excalibur publicly denouncing them as well. So it 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 definitely is more of a gray area now that I think they exist in. Um, I think JR in particular was really good at like being pissed off at them. Actually, I I quite enjoyed JR throughout this episode. He he was like really good on all the storyline points. His response when Taz, because Taz has to defend every heel action. He said, well, they're trying to send a message. Oh, get out of here. Sending a message. <laughs> Jim Ross was pissed. Like he conveyed he was pissed mm. about Tony. It was like a real reaction. Like that, hey, my friend just got super kicked and it's bullshit because he's not a wrestler. Yes. Dasha interviewed SCU. While the others are playing checkers, they're playing chess. And then Scorpio Sky and Kazarian, they proceed to head out to the ring, and Sky runs into Sean Spears, who mockingly wishes Sky good luck, uh, playing off of uh, their their issue from the uh, from the special last week. Uh, but n- nothing involving Spears, even though we kind of got the tease here during the match. Not during the match, but you would assume this would continue in some form. Uh, the tag match, this was our brush with greatness. So the tag titles are being defended, but there's a 20-minute time limit. And Hangman Page is out on commentary, and he states that he is not done with the tag division, and that's why he's out here on commentary, to scout. And they bring up that Omega's been out here, and he does seem to be done with the tag division. And Page counters saying, yeah, well, how many singles matches has he had so far? None. So he thinks that Kenny Omega is saying one thing, but means another. Yeah. So he's a, he's almost in denial about Kenny, you know, breaking up with him. And uh, yeah, still hoping for the best, I guess. So between Paige and Omega, which one is Okada and which one is the Rainmaker? Oh, which one is the Rainmaker? Which one is the money clip, perhaps? Well, the money clip, I guess, would be... Um, who, I guess we haven't really had, like, it's not like we have a new partner that's been... I guess the singles the career is the money clip. Yeah, there you have it. <laughs> if you want to hear the greatest dissection of what Okada is going through right now, uh, we spent like 10 minutes on it on today's G1 podcast. And I think we, we tried to make sense of it. And in doing so, we accidentally stumbled onto what I thought was an even way better idea had Kenny Omega stayed in New Japan. Well, we shall see how this uh, Rainmaker storyline ends. It's certainly, I would say, maybe one of the more controversial aspects of this G1 thus far. And um, I think it definitely takes, like, you know, talking about it with other fans, like like I'm doing with you, to really kind of, I don't know, fully, like, analyze what exactly is going on here. So I enjoyed the conversation, and uh, I'd love to know your theories if you're listening. Early on, Cash Wheeler runs the ropes and trips himself, blames Christopher Daniels, and he gets ejected. I thought that was great. It was excellent, yes. Their heel stuff throughout the entire match, I think, was fantastic. Kazarian Kazarian was, I thought, the best of the four in this match. This was a match I really enjoyed, but Frankie Kazarian, I thought, um, he was the glue of this match. I was very impressed with him. Anytime he's on TV, like, I know, like, there are guys who are, you know, long, long-time long veterans, people who are getting up there in age that I don't know if you would really consider them ever for a world championship level, but a guy like Kaz has always been consistent, has no signs of slowing down whatsoever, and uh, probably quite underrated. I think so. Like, he's, like, that just tells you, like, the depth when you see a Frankie Kazarian out there. And, I mean, the guy just always consistent, and he looked great in this match. Um, Sky went for this cradle, but meanwhile, Cash Wheeler was distracting Paul Turner. It's just, like, all the great little heel tricks that FTR utilize are just make the, the match, like, such a fun little, like, 
whole roller coaster ride. There's an O'Connor roll and Northern Lights combo by Kazarian onto both men, then a fisherman suplex to Wheeler getting a two count. They tease later coming up tonight an announcement for full gear that would come up after the match. Wheeler hit a dragon suplex on Kazarian for a two count, and then they lifted up Kazarian on the shoulders, and you almost thought they were going for a doomsday device like a tribute, and Kaz counters with a power slam to Harwood coming off the top. That looked great. We got Scorpio Sky with the sequence of near falls as the intensity builds up. Then Tully holds on to Wheeler's arms until Sky pulls him away. There's a suplex attempt by Sky with Tully pulling the leg out. It's the Bobby Heenan Ultimate Warrior WrestleMania 5 spot. And Wheeler lands on top as Tully holds down Scorpio Sky's leg and Tully uh, leads he gives the assist and they get the pinfall 15 minutes and 42 seconds not only uh was this a really entertaining tag match it establishes the brush with greatness there's uh you know tully helps outsmart them but this also segues in perfectly to scorpio sky with sean spears with tully's other guy that's right yes uh, it was a awesome match uh very physical constantly active between the two teams um, I thought, you know, the moves themselves were really fantastic, but to me, it's, it's again, like the great heel work of the FTR that I really enjoy. Um, that spot where Tully or, uh, where, or, um, you know, they pretend that Daniel stripped them. Uh, not only, you know, was it, I think great at the time, but I think it also prevented Daniels from getting involved at the end, which allowed Tully to trip, um, Scorpio at the end without mm-hmm. somebody stopping him. Also, I thought it was brilliant because it was the same damn move that Tully actually used in the end. So I think a lot of cleverness here. Yeah, a lot, lot of great stuff uh, for this match. And what did you think about the the concept here of like these these twenty minute matches on TV? I like it. I honestly would even like suggest that you cut it down to like maybe fifteen. You can even get by with ten, to be quite honest with you, because like that just makes them more heels in my opinion maybe adds even more urgency to to these matches 20 minutes is you know fine but i think it's almost like i mean it just becomes a standard match at that point because how many matches go beyond 20 minutes you know usually the usual time limit for an aw match is what is 20 minutes too isn't it title matches are what are longer than that yes but um i think to really like create urgency and to create you know, a certain maybe, I don't know, accessibility and, and a pace. I think you can even shorten it. But at this point, I don't think they will. So the announcement for Full Gear is that they're going to hold an eight-man single elimination tournament. The finals will take place at Full Gear with the winner getting a future AEW title shot. And the first three entrants are Ray Phoenix, Jungle Boy, and Kenny Omega, which was worth it for Hangman's response as he has this shocked look on his face and he just gets up and leaves the booth as Kenny Omega. He's found his money clip. It's the tournament. Yes. Yes. Uh, Pager's acting has been like both of their acting, both he and Kenny. I wouldn't say it's been good acting, but like for professional wrestling, I think it kind of hits that sweet spot where it's like kind of campy. Um, and you know, but at the same time, something you can, you know, understand here, like throughout the entire timeline commentary, Paige sort of play, played a combination of like insecure and also a little bit drunk. Um, I think if it, it's been amusing to watch, I mean, it's no uh, Aaliyah and Dominic Mysterio, but almost at that level. And in, in either case, I, I, I found it entertaining. Oh man, I'm imagining Kenny and Hangman. The books are right. You are naive. <laughs> Uh, this tournament looks great, just based on the first three entrants. Um, mm-hmm. Man, if we if we get an Omega Phoenix match in this tournament, I mean that's going to be spectacular. Do you think Paige joins? That would be a great like eighth entrant. Like keep one a mystery, and it's Hangman goes for it, and you have them on like opposite sides of the brackets. Maybe that's a yeah. logical way we could get to Paige and Omega in the finals. Mm-hmm. Possible. Um, apparently there was an imaginary tournament tonight, and the Butcher won it. Um, I guess to, so. He got there to was some process of elim- elimination that ended with Butcher getting a title shot. Yeah, Moxley put out this open challenge, and I guess he was uh, he was there to respond to the email quickly. I guess Eddie Kingston was maybe. We'll get to that. Isaiah Cassidy. Yes, we will. Isaiah Cassidy versus Chris Jericho. We had uh, Matt Hardy out with a 
a chair along with Mark Quinn while the whole inner circle was in Jericho's corner. Jericho's You, you bull- know, like, it, I know it's been several months that Matt Hardy has been, like, coming out with Private Party, but it still just seems like such an odd pairing to me because, like, they, they're they coming out to this, like, you know, uh, like partying entrance and Matt Hardy comes out. And middle-aged Matt Hardy, honestly, I'm sorry, he seems like the least likely guy to be in the VIP section of a club. Like, he comes across here like more like the chaperone at like a high school dance <laughs> than somebody who like feels like a natural part of this thing. Uh, yeah, he's Mr. Hardy. This is new new personality. High school teacher. Yeah, high school high school teacher that still shops a hot topic. Mm. Comes on like casual Fridays and is like, "Whoa, Mr. Hardy." He's the guy who tries to be like the cool teacher. <laughs> He's trying to be the cool teacher. Jericho's what do you guys bullying think of JPEG Mafia guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was not expecting a that that particular joke. That was very good. Um, by the way, your your singing uh, was it the was it the, the Sting man song? called Sting? That's my jam oh. now, dude. Yeah. Like you broke Chris for like that was like. <laughs> 15 seconds of laughter. Like, I, that was like, he loved that. We had a couple sing alongs. We had a couple sing alongs on this show. And, um, yeah, Chris's rendition of the, um, Ravishing Recruit theme I thought was tremendous. Um, maybe got a bit of Nate Milton singing the, uh, Ricky Steamboat theme as well, which he loves. Um, that Family Man song is amazing. Um, it's my podcast of the year. Well, thank you very much. Well, we shall see if it, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I had a lot of fun doing it, and and it would have been that much better if you were a part of it, John. I uh, no, no, honestly, I wouldn't have added anything that you three uh, on the musical front. You three were perfect. We got to do a sequel, and we definitely have to have you on. Well, uh, Jericho was not looking for a sequel here with Isaiah Cassidy because he was just beating the hell out of him until Cassidy jumps him from behind. And started getting a number of covers on him, including with a Mahistral Cradle. He catapults Jericho to the floor. And Jericho gets sent over the guardrail, shoves Luther, and Luther knocks him back over. So you can see that was done with a purpose. Uh, there was a Tornillo by Cassidy onto the whole inner circle. And then a Swanton for a two count. We go through the break. Jericho takes over, catapults Cassidy's throat into the bottom rope. Hager then nails Cassidy. And in the process, Hager like busted his nose open here. It looked like he just like came into contact with Cassidy and just like cut open, cut his nose. But um, it was probably from that Tornillo, I'm, I'm guessing, to the floor. And we just didn't see hmm. uh, he might have nailed Hager on that spot because I didn't know like where else could he have done this. Uh, Cassidy goes for a springboard stunner, gets a two count. He's getting all these near falls. Jericho tries the lion salt. Cassidy gets his knees up. So Jericho gets hit with his own lion salt, kicks out of it. Then Cassidy hits a code breaker. And then finally, he goes for a springboard right into the Judas effect. And Jericho pins him at 11 minutes and six seconds. I I thought these two did really great together. I thought this was an excellent match. I think Jericho has made a real art out of having these types of matches with these like you know, cruiserweight baby faces at the bottom of the card, uh, they're almost always entertaining. I mean, the guy made a whole feud of it with Orange Cassidy. Uh, I thought this really showed off Cassidy, uh, Isaiah Cassidy, as an excellent baby face, great selling, great quickness. If I had to compare, like, the two private party singles matches that we've seen, you know, between this one and, like, Mark Quinn versus Cody, I enjoyed this match more. But I think both showed off how well-rounded both of these guys in private party are as potential singles guys. I, th- I, I, I thought this was uh, the match I enjoyed more of, of those two examples, but I also really just enjoy like the, just all the different ways like Jericho used the, this Judas effect. That's the most, you know, it's that and the paradigm shift that are like the two significant finishers in, in this company. So I hated um, that move when he debuted, but absolutely. Yes. Like the guy has, yeah, he's made it work. The inner circle get in for the attack. Hardy clears the ring with a chair, but then Jericho gets into it with Luther while Hager attacks Serpentico, and that will lead us to a tag match next week. So Jericho's anniversary show, he will get to do a match on TV with Dr. Luther. Yeah, yeah. The Chaos Project of uh, Luther and Serpentico, who uh, they tell us have been uh, undefeated on AEW Dark. So 
it's a huge match for Luther. I'm I'm kind of glad that like we're finally getting a bit of an introduction to him and Ser- Serpentico. Like the guy's been in the company for what what feels like a year now, and I don't know if he's ever had a match on Dynamite. I mean, he did all the stuff with like Brandy, but I don't even know if it, like at most he might might have done like a tag here or there, or some battle royal. But um, you know, this is certainly like the biggest match he's had here. Um, I, I really hope over the next week that maybe we get a promo from Luther. I think that that could have helped tonight, like just to hear from him. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's also not, um, you know, maybe they uh, want some of that mystique with the character too, I, not cutting a promo about his history with Jericho. A lot of that heavy lifting will, will have to be done by Excalibur, who kind of got into it here, like via, like, you can tell, like, they overdubbed some of this explanation of Luther and Jericho training together at the dungeon. So I imagine during the match, you'll get a big history lesson. There was a segment with Miro and Kip Sabian in an empty, like, uh, like a David Dave Busters. Busters. Yeah. yeah. Miro promises an epic bachelor party. He then threw his blue balls. Then they took part in axe throwing. And as Miro is playing with the pinball machine, up comes Billy Mitchell, the man that was the star of like the. Most insane documentary I've ever seen, The King of Kong, if you have never seen this. It's not so much insane. It's just like a fascinating look at this world of uh, these guys going for the record, which Billy Mitchell holds. I guess this was somewhat disputed, but he has regained control of the records for Pac-Man and Donkey Kong in the Guinness Book of Records after I guess these records have been at one point taken away from him, but have since been restored. That sounds like a an amazing documentary. It's it's actually you you'd enjoy it. Like I haven't watched it in years, but it's one of those things where it's like a whole documentary on guys trying to get the world record for Donkey Kong. And it's again, it's the personalities that make a great documentary and that is Billy Mitchell who what weird dude. When this dude showed up on camera, like I thought I thought this dude might have been related to Bruce Mitchell. Like he looked like a skinny like sinister minister oh you mean jim mitchell jim mitchell sorry yes not a bruce mitchell of the torch sorry not bruce mitchell yes um i guess there there is a similarity there um i did not i did not recognize this guy upon seeing him but then when excalibur identified him i was like oh this guy i've actually seen the documentary this felt like just a one-off cameo i don't know if we're gonna have any more billy mitchell but who knows really it seemed like they were trying to Build something up here for this bachelor party with Billy Mitchell. Well, maybe, maybe they, they they've already shot the bachelor party with Billy Mitchell. I mean, I look this guy up like not to like. I think there has to be a rule. Okay, you can only claim someone's a celebrity if they have more followers than you. And like, this guy would not qualify as a celebrity. You know, not but not rule. everybody's big on like Twitter, right? Like well, people, some people are like bigger on in two thousand twenty. How else am I to measure someone's worth? It's very true. You're right. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Um, yeah, we'll see if Billy Mitchell comes back. Maybe this guy's a hell of a promo. Um, I mean, he's a bit of a heel in this community, it seems. Really? Okay. Dasha interviewed the best friends with Orange Cassidy and FTR interrupt. Well, let's get back to that. Like, what do you think so far of this is like Miro thing? Uh, it hasn't really grabbed me in, in any way. Like, I'm sure. I don't know. To, to me, it's... Um, this segment this week, he just felt like any guy on the roster. Yeah, like I was definitely curious to see like how much they would lean into the the comedic video gaming side of it. Um, you know, as opposed to like trying to portray him as a serious threat in ring while doing all this stuff. And it's like they've really leaned into the comedy with with him and, and Sabian. Um, to the point where like they were talking about rum springers. Um <laughs> and I think, you know, to some people it might be endearing, but I think for an AEW fan, they want to see Rusev be taken as a serious threat. I guess I don't know if this is it. I mean, he's a naturally very, very funny guy, and I don't mind the idea of doing, like, segments that are going to really showcase that that aspect of him. Uh, but, but They're getting me, really niche, you know? Well, they're they're doing that, and it's also, like, to me, it's... I don't know. They just haven't expanded upon the joke. It's like, okay, it's it's the Twitch guys, but to me, there there needs to be something more to it than just this. Um, 
I don't know. This was kind of a nothing segment to me. It's it's not one I gave a whole lot of thought in, but uh, by the end of it, I mean he just he just feels like he has just joined the roster, and he doesn't feel like he's a he's a big deal on the roster by week three. Yeah, certainly not up there. Like not somebody you could really see transition to like a world title program um, at all. Dasha uh, interviewed the best friends in Cassidy. FTR interrupted, saying they did them a favor last week, not giving them a tag title shot. They're where they belong, in the middle of the card as comedic backyard wrestlers. We are main eventers. And Cassidy took the microphone and called them weenies. It's a good Orange Cassidy insult. Orange Cassidy took on 10. Preston Vance. 10 took off the sunglasses of Cassidy, placing them on John Silver. And then 10 attacks... Hits a delayed vertical suplex. Ran Cassidy into the guardrail. Uh, Silver and Alan Angels do the best friends hug on 10. And they even did the zoom out for it. Got to do the zoom out. Yeah. With Taz yelling, got to give the people what they want. Cassidy dove onto all three from the top. Then 10 catches Cassidy. Turns it into a swinging DDT. Orange punch and the beach break as Cassidy pins 10 in three and a half minutes. This is a brutal move. This like belly to back pile driver, man. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I thought Ten was a good opponent for Cassidy. You know, trying to a bit of a rehab coming off of the Brody Brody Lee loss last week. Ca- Orange Cassidy is a character that definitely worked better against these big guys, and you know, made for an impressive win for him uh, off of a guy who really is just a jobber. Then, man, this is this is the best storyline going right now. MJF is giving shit to Wardlow outside of the inner circle's room. They knock and they go in and they've got a gift for the inner circle. MJF has gotten them team jackets and he hands them out with the exception of Sammy Guevara. They're one short and MJF blames Wardlow. He is profusely sorry to the point he swears on his mother's life which I will imagine will come to, we will come to learn that the man lied on his mother's life. He just wanted to congratulate them. And Jericho says, MJF, do you want to join the inner circle? I asked you this once before. And MJF answers the question with a question by saying, I recall asking you once and didn't get an answer. Do you want me? To join the inner circle. And they go back and forth. Neither's going to crack. And MJF says that, you know what, Chris? You've had a legendary run after 30 years and thanks them. And him and Jericho, it's like these two double agents and neither one wants to let their guard down to the other. And MJF leaves with Wardlow. Guevara is about to call him a loser, but Jericho says maybe he's not. I... I'm so into this because I know that they have got this whole thing mapped out. And we thought that when they did this first face-to-face after the pay-per-view a couple weeks back that, okay, they're going to do this and this will be this long tease. Like, this is a weekly thing they're doing now that maybe we're going to get some uh, more significant payoff sooner than we think. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think I thought initially, you know, when they were doing it, oh, it was just kind of like a nice little cute segment between two of the heels. They are directly building to something um, that we're probably going to see come to fruition very soon. So it it seems like they're working some sort of jealousy angle between Sammy Guevara, um, maybe playing off of like some of the insecurity or like the absences recently of Sammy Guevara, um, playing around with that whole dynamic and teasing that potentially MJF might be his replacement. It's all really fascinating. And I'm totally into like heel heel storylines are aren't very obvious to predict. So I'm really curious to see how they'll work together. Um, some of the things I, I really love or some of the details of anytime you have MJF and Jericho together on screen, they definitely like make an effort to create some form of symmetry in the camera frame. Anytime these two are together, whether it be the first time with the both of them walking in together and then even pulling out in their cars together. This time it was like uh, MJF and Jericho standing one side of the screen meeting the other. And it's like they're, they're heavies standing right next to him and Hager and Wardlow. Mm. Uh, mirroring each other so those little details i really enjoy seeing and you also got a a return to mjf being the asshole to wardlow like keeping that active too right that should be something long down the road but keeping that uh in people's mind 
Dr. Britt Baker had her first match back on Dynamite. They reminded us this is her first match since the uh, brutal tooth and nail match. Against Red Velvet. Uh, Baker was out with Rebel. Uh, Baker Velvet. with Red Velvet. Oh my God. How did they miss this? I'm disappointed I missed this. Wait, you have you you have just outdone me. That is fantastic. She's um, got to have a well, stable of 12 people. The Baker's doesn't. Oh my God, Baker's doesn't. Man, I love it. Um, <laughs> there's a back elbow, leg lariat by Velvet. She gets in quite a bit of offense here, and then Baker takes over with her strikes, hits a sling blade, rolls out of a, a kick out, or kicks out of a roll up, and then nails this super kick, and then almost hits like a kind of a version of a curb stomp, which is the finish at 442. Certainly a more vicious side for Baker, mm -hmm. uh, and then afterwards beats the hell out of Velvet, um, gets the glove, and applies the lockjaw. I don't know if it was like just her version of the lockjaw or if it was meant to be taken like Seth Rollins' version, but seems to be like a new finisher for Britt Baker that's, you know, uh, in addition to the lockjaw, of course, that's definitely a lot more heelish, a lot more vicious. I thought this was like a really good kind of old school, strong jobber match for Britt Baker. She looked really dominant here and gave a lot of attitude, in my opinion, uh, a lot of great heel charisma. So, you know, she's definitely been establishing herself as a comedy figure, but I think the intent here in ring, especially come along, coming off of that cinematic match, was to establish her as a more violent threat. Yes. Um, yeah. The less we say about the tooth and nail match, the better. Well, what, hap what happened to Swole? Like, why hasn't she been around? Uh, we haven't seen her. We, we haven't seen her since the pay-per-view, have we? I don't think so. You know, didn't she win that match? She did win the match. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know if that feud's done with Britt Baker because like didn't really get a follow up uh, or any indication on this match. Um, what do you think is next for Britt? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's because she does like probably got the Rosa match rematch coming up. Like she's teaming with her and everything. Yeah. They're kind of going that way. Um, you don't really have like a baby face that's ready, f um, you know, beyond Cheetah. Um, unless you like, I, I don't even know where you necessarily go. I mean, it's feels like they need to do like a proper match with, with Baker and Swole, like in ring. You know? Perhaps. Yeah. You could, you could go back to that. Um, I don't know that, that just felt so cold after that pay-per-view and mm -hmm. they really didn't allude to it at all. So uh, we'll see where they go. Like there's not the, obvious program but you can heat someone up very quickly um i mean it is maybe you heat up <laughs> red velvet for <laughs> Britt baker and a rematch 350 um yeah exactly uh they could they could escalate it maybe we go 400 Ooh. next week it's jericho's anniversary show and i'll correct myself the there isn't an nba game next week so that will be very helpful for next week's show uh but we've got the whatever the Jericho, they didn't really plug like there's going to be some ceremony or something, but I've got to imagine there's something with Jericho for next week, like that ceremonial segment. It'll probably be like the what they did with the tag team appreciation thing, maybe like one segment. You definitely demands it. Yeah. Do maybe you do, maybe you do like the on cameras throughout the night and it's the baby faces that like have to begrudgingly put over Jericho, or you have the heels that are so insincere, but being assholes about it. I think that's a great idea. You might get something from MJF for sure. Mm -hmm. Do we, you know, given, given the fact that they are do it, putting Luther in this match for like the, the symbolism, I would imagine like if, if this wasn't the pandemic, I think a hundred percent Lance is on this show. Yeah. I forget that he's uh, stuck in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. I hope to at least see a video or something. I could see a video of him on, on the show. If they do that idea, um, I could see, I could see, I could see actually they get a bunch of guys mm -hmm. sending in videos and maybe you go off the roster and you get other people like think of all those celebrities we got for that. Um, remember that, uh, the deal they did, the, uh, oh, what was it? What was it called? The, the Manitoba melee. Um, Yes. Where they got yes. the cameos from like Lou Ferrigno and yes, others. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. I don't know what they're going to do next week, but I'm pretty confident that they're going to have something really funny that we're going to be entertained by next week for mm. this. Uh, so it's Jericho and Hager against Luther and Serpentico. Brian Cage against Will Hobbs for the FTW title and the dog collar match between Brody and Cody uh, for the TNT title. And that's 
It's a big stipulation match with Cody. And the last time they did a big stipulation match with Cody, it was that first time steel cage match with Wardlow. And that show did a phenomenal number back in February for Cody and Wardlow. So, Hmm. um, you know, you do have uh, stuff like baseball playoffs going on, but the fact the NBA isn't on, like I, th- I think for a week a build up with this match and the Jericho thing, like that, that's a show that should do well next week. When's the next debate? The next debate is next week is the vice presidential debate, and then the next presidential one is in two weeks. Uh, but they're on Thursdays. Uh, it's it's a Thursday. Yeah. Right. Okay. Are you are you looking forward to the next one? Oh God. I just I just want to know when to be ready. Like when to be ready for the shit storm on online and everywhere. CNN was unbelievable afterwards. Like their reaction it was just crazy. Like they were shocked. Dana Bash just flat out called it a shit show on the air. I mean that was I think the the prevailing reaction from most of the country, most of the world. Eddie Kingston came out and I would love to have a debate with Eddie Kingston on the show with somebody. That would be great. Hmm. He comes out with Bryce <laughs> I think Remsburg. We got samples of it. Like anytime he was out there with Jake and Taz and everybody talking over each other. <laughs> yeah, we, we did. We haven't had Jake. Uh, well, I guess there's uh, with no Lance, there's no Jake for now. Um, Eddie Kingston comes out with Bryce, Penta and Phoenix. And he calls Bryce Remsburg his friend of 18 years but professes he did not tap out last week against Moxley. Moxley said he would face anyone. Kingston doesn't feel up for another match with him, but he first asks Bryce why he ended the match last week. And Bryce explains, you were unresponsive. We might have our personal friendship, but when we're in this ring, this is professional. And it's my job to protect you from yourself. I thought Bryce cut a great promo here. I think anytime you see Bryce Remberg, you know, like within him is like somebody who really wants to be a performer and he is a great performer. Um, Sometimes like if you ask certain people, they might think that he's too much of a performer as a referee. But Mm -hmm. like when he's called upon for a scene like this, absolutely. I think he delivered. So they circle Bryce. um, But before they can attack Remsburg, Moxley's music hits and he enters with a barbed wire bat. And Moxley is staring down Kingston on the floor when the butcher appears from behind him as Kingston reveals that he's not facing any of them. He's facing the butcher who jumps Moxley and the match begins for the AEW title in our main event. And the butcher goes to town on the left knee and this became the focus of his attack. Uh, Moxley, he sold the knee significantly throughout the match, like collapsing on the floor, Irish whip attempts, like the knee was... Um, you know, he paid attention to the knee the whole match. Yeah, yeah. I thought he did great uh, in that aspect. But, you know, on the other side, it really relied on the butcher to, like, work on the leg, do a bit of submission. He was going for a stretch muffler. Uh, the announcers were noting it is really hot outside and we don't have any AC out here. There's a weak Irish whip and Moxley's knee gives way. They go to the floor. Um, Moxley eventually catches him with a superplex, but Butcher goes back to the leg. Butcher is sent into the corner. He hits a pile driver on Butcher. Butcher kicks out, comes back with a cross body, and then Moxley hits a DDT and then the bulldog choke, forcing Butcher to tap out. And it ends with Moxley staring down Kingston. Eddie is pissed. And that's how the show ends. Um, I thought it was a decent match between the two, but I, I wouldn't say one of the better matches of the show. Like it was, it was serviceable for an AEW title match and for an AEW main event. Even I definitely thought it was on the lower end. Um, I thought Moxie selling was great. Like you really buy the struggle on his face. He, I thought he made Butcher look like way more of a challenge than Butcher probably was. But I think this match really worked. Like the length of this match maybe worked really worked against the Butcher. Like this was a big test for the guy. Like he's a guy who's not used to. Working singles matches, at least not lately, um, it's 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 a longer length and very demanding for him, especially in this heat. I also felt like his moveset was a little bit limited and exposed in a match like this. Like, the body bar- part type of, um, you know, psychology thing felt very unnatural for, like, what he, what I'm used to seeing him doing, what I saw him do here. I think he tried his best, but I definitely felt like the, the length of the match um, didn't, definitely didn't play to his strengths, so... And he like 
both men kind of looked, you know, pretty tired by the end, but definitely the butcher. And I imagine, you know, the heat probably would have played like the heat is just something you can, I guess, I don't know. Um, it's that X factor, I suppose, in this, in this, um, Daly's place that you, you can always call attention to, I suppose. But I thought under the circumstances, like they both did a good job. Um, I still enjoyed it. Yeah. I would say like tonight's dynamite, it, it was a really good episode. I would say, the first hour I thought was really, really solid. Like pre- pretty much the show, I would say up until the, the Jericho MJF backstage segment. Um, I think everything up into, uh, up and including that segment were, uh, really, really strong. You know, the, the last hour, it was fine. Um, but I thought the show really had a solid first hour. I thought it was a strong show. Um, and yeah, maybe weaker towards the second half, but even like a weaker second half was still, I think, very enjoyable to me. Um, just a, a good two hours of, of pro wrestling, like top to bottom. All right, let's go on over to the forum, uh, forum.postwrestling.com to get your feedback to tonight's show and the show generated on our board, a 7.85, another strong number for AEW. Noah from Vaughn kicks us off after last night's debate debacle, the brawl tonight seemed mild in comparison. Darby versus Ricky was fantastic, and I was super excited to see Darby get the win. He's so popular that he doesn't need to win every big match, but giving him a win like this helps give him some much-needed momentum. You have no idea how happy I was to see MJF and Jericho do a callback to their interaction they had last year on the post-Full Gear episode of Dynamite, and it seems the seeds have been planted for Sammy's face turn when he gets kicked out of the inner circle in favor of MJF taking his spot. If Moxley is able to beat Archer at the anniversary show, who do you see facing him? at full gear. Um, I think you have to shoot some big angle. Um, You know, the way they're teasing this is that it's like, he's going to go through uh, Kingston's guys. And maybe like you pull the trigger on someone like a Pentagon junior for the pay-per-view. Cause whoever it's going to be is someone that's, you just pretty much have to tap to take this challenger spot. Cause it's not like anyone's being organically built for this. What's up with this tournament? What's at the end of it? The winner gets a shot, but the finals are on the pay per view. It's a oh, fu- future right. title shot, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I could see one uh, one of those members. Uh, you know, the thing is, like Penta, they really have to kind of build up a little bit more as just a character, and certainly you would expect that with uh, Eddie Kingston by his side. So, I yeah, I could definitely see that. They got five episodes before the pay per view. We got a Raymond in Sacramento who says, my feedback will be short because I was pulling double duty watching the second hour of Dynamite and the NBA Finals at the same time. What I did see was really good matches from the start to the end of the game. Opener was really good. The tag match was great. Isaiah Cassidy really did well again with Jericho. Did they face each other before? Jericho and Cassidy? Um, not that, like they did a tag match. But I don't remember tag a match. singles That's between right. the yeah, two okay. Britt's return was mat work heavy, and she looked good doing it. And the Butcher got a man, main event slot and pulled out a big leg drop on Moxley. I loved it all. As I'm writing this feedback, there was an arm bar into the sliding back cradle pin attempt of LeBron James during a scramble for a loose ball. Okay. All right. Kenny, I love this show. Darby was great. Ricky Starks might be my new favorite wrestler. I love Cassidy and Jericho. With the inner circle's reactions outside the ring, making the match seem so much bigger than it was. MJF was great. Tag was great. Even the Butcher was better than expected. Gives the show a 10 out of 10. Okay. Oh, here's... <laughs> dude, here's a photo of it. This th- this helps everybody when you're describing wow. something uh, with this photo. Uh, yeah, look at this. Uh, Zack Sabre Jr. techniques here on mm-hmm. during the NBA final tonight. All right, finally, we got a Sean from Albany who says, Hey, guys, positives about this show. Ricky starts facial expressions in ring. Tony Schiavone eating a super kick. Hangman spit take. Uh, the attention to detail. Okay, he says, uh, wait. MJF with the jack. Okay, I think Jericho stopping Sammy was a subtle nod to the camera still being there. The attention to detail is stellar for those segments, and they can seemingly turn crap, crap into gold using BTE. Okay, so he's saying Jericho stopping Sammy was a nod that somebody. A cameraman was in the room watching them. You know what? I I bet that's completely true because, I mean, we've had literally Jericho and MJF reference the fact that, you know, the other watched Dynamite and mm. w- w- Jericho would s- knows that this is airing. And somehow Sammy Guevara either doesn't care or doesn't realize that this is airing. So they're planning to screw him somehow. 
So Jericho knows that the camera is on, which I'm sure is a level of detail they're aware of. His negatives are the women's division. It's been nearly a year at this point. There are storylines and seats for stories all over the place, except for this division. It is clear that whomever is responsible for the women's division simply isn't up to the task of layered storytelling. Is Tay Conti in dark order? Who is the number one contender? When is Blade coming to steal his wife back and break up the Nightmare Sisters? I watch every week. Oh yeah, that was another thing that they had teased um, that they couldn't follow up on and presumably because Blade was not available. Blade was not on the show tonight, so... Yeah. Yeah. He says, uh, I watch every week and listen to this show religiously, and, and I cannot answer these questions. That is a problem. I'm tired of the women on the AEW roster being let down by creative. To quote MJF, we deserve better. Jim Ross, I love JR, but his get-off-my-lawn old man routine is getting to be tiresome. Tonight, when Eddie Kingston came out with Penta and Phoenix, JR yelled, What the hell is this? Did they even bother to give JR the rundown for the show? If he was expressing surprise because Remsburg was there... That was not clear at all. Sounded more like Jared forgot that there's only one more segment. And he also thought Jericho and Isaiah Cassidy look sloppy at times. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't have an issue with like JR saying that. I mean, I think I did feel like, to me, he conveyed that he was surprised that um, Eddie Kingston was dragging out a referee. You know? That's how I took it. It was like they, they were taking the, the referee and like forcing him into the ring. Like, why are they manhandling this official? Yeah. So... Um, all right. Well, thank you everybody for your feedback. Uh, up next is available. So you can go get a whole rundown of that for the show going into takeover this Sunday, which just to look at the lineup, we've got Finn Balor and Kyle O'Reilly for the NXT title, Io Shirai, Candice LeRae for the women's title, Damian Priest and Johnny Gargano for the North American title, Kushida versus Velveteen Dream and Santos Escobar defending the cruiserweight title against Isaiah Swerve Scott. So those are our five matches for Sunday. So I'm I'm really looking forward uh, to especially those top two matches with the uh, the women's title and Balor O'Reilly. For me, it's Balor O'Reilly. I mean, that's such a fresh match. I think, you know, the, the ability to see Kyle O'Reilly in a big main event position in itself is is huge to me. Um, and I'm really hoping for, like, a big break, breakthrough for performance. You know, we all know how talented he is. But um, I think, you know, in a single capacity, I, I look forward to, like, him just wowing everybody. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Maybe... Maybe they can take a page from the UFC and the build-up video for Valor O'Reilly can be the who. <laughs> Valor O'Reilly. Wonderful. Can't top that. What a great way to end. Goodbye. <laughs>